Do you ever do this? I sometimes like to imagine someone from outer space looking what I or we are doing, like an alien looking at our mobility system, a system that kills 1.3 million people worldwide every year and leaves 50 million injured. Last year, in Germany, 2,562 people were killed in traffic accidents. Yes, that's 86% less than 50 years ago, but it's still a number that's far too high to be accepted if it were created by machines rather than by humans. Another 4 million worldwide die from the pollution from the transportation sector, 13,000 in Germany. If you look at Munich from outer space at any point in time, there's around 40,000 cars being used. The other 710,000 are sitting around or standing around unused, taking up valuable urban space. I've calculated something like two and a half times the English garden or 12 soccer fields. And the capacity utilization of the system is appalling. About 1.5% of all seats are being used at any given point in time. This is what we call the external costs of a certain mode of transport. Now, the alien would ask, why on earth would people do this, do it like this, keep up the system? Well, it's because we love the privacy and the independence that the car offers us. In my generation, the symbol of becoming an adult was to own your first car. So it's become deeply entrenched into our lives, it's shaped our personal habits, and uh, our cars have been built around it. They've been built to accommodate the car. And this is even, although the system is expensive to the individual too. The car is the second largest expense of the average household after housing. And people usually widely underestimate the true cost of their car. If you ask them, they say they spend around 200 bucks per month on their car. In reality, it's more like 425 at least. If you take a fully comprehensive look, if you consider operating costs, fixed costs, vehicle depreciation, maintenance and repair, and things like residential parking costs, you run up 550 euros per month for a small car. 630 for a medium-sized car, and more than 1,000 euros for a large car. Let's look at the external cost of the car. Here we're talking about infrastructure costs that are not covered by the individual drivers, by taxes or fees. We're looking at environmental costs, and we're looking at health costs, specifically from accidents. And there's no real transparency, let alone consensus about these numbers, but they easily add up to another 400 euros per month per car. And this is a cost that we're finding exceedingly difficult to cover as a society. So, again, my um, alien friend is listening intensely. He's getting more and more puzzled uh, what we're going to do about it. I forgot to say one thing um, in terms of costs. If you look at the health perspective, look at it from a health perspective, the active modes of transportation, like walking and cycling, they don't only cost less than other modes, they actually also produce benefits for society by keep, keeping people healthier. So my alien friend is asking, what are we going to do to change this system to more sustainability? I'm convinced we need three things. We need less vehicles, we need lighter and smaller vehicles, and we need shared vehicles. The single most important and effective measure a city can take to reduce the number of cars in the cities is to put a price on urban space. Now, people react very strongly to monetary measures. They're not popular politically, right? Um, but they always work. Of course, um, we just must be aware that a price of zero that we have now 
is also a price, and it attracts more vehicles and more traffic. Of course, bans also work, but to put a price on urban space is the better method, because it puts money into the system that can then be used to build infrastructure for other, less costly modes, and especially to prepare, to prepare our cities for autonomous driving. I'll get back to that later. Then we also need lighter vehicles. Lighter vehicles have lower social costs, because in the case of accidents, they produce less injuries and less fatalities. And there's a lot of companies and startups working on new concepts for micromobility and smaller and lighter vehicles, which is great. Look at the success of the e-bike and the e-cargo bike and all its variants that are available now. And I personally um, think there's a lot of potential in vehicles that offer protection from bad weather. There's an interesting vehicle class called L7E, where the vehicles are not allowed to weigh more than 450 kilos, which is quite enough to ship around one or two people on short distances. This class is quite successful in Japan, but for it to be really popular here, I think for people to want to use these cars, they must look attractive and cool, otherwise they won't succeed. And then the third measure is shared vehicles. Obviously, if you share vehicles and you use less vehicles and use them more, this will reduce the social costs of each trip. And autonomous driving will be a real game changer here. Taking out the driver out of the calculation and using shared fleets will lower the price of each trip so much that it will not make much sense for people to keep their own private car which they will only use very rarely. So these three things. Now, my alien friend is getting really impatient. He says, so what do we do until we have autonomous driving? Well, I think that um, really calculating the true costs and benefits of every mode of transportation is, um, delivers strong arguments for political and personal choices especially at a time where sustainability has become such an important criterion for private choices and political decision-making. And if I know and have a transparency on the costs and benefits of each mode of transport, I don't need an app every morning to tell me what to choose. I, I just know it. It's because it's the same calculation most of the time. That's why four years ago I decided to change. As a matter of principle, I will take my bike for every trip under 10 kilometers in the city. In German cities, including Munich, 50% of all trips taken by cars in the cities are less than 5 kilometers. Now, 5 kilometers is the distance where you have an exact trade-off between the car and the bike. 20 minutes by car, not including the search for a spark parking spot, and 20 minutes by bike. So if I don't have to look for a parking spot, I will always be faster by bike. So that's why I, I made this choice. Under 10 kilometers, as a matter of principle, I will use the bike. It gives me the chance to get at least some exercise into a long working day. I like it because I have the best ideas riding my bike. I like it because it's cheap, and I enjoy the fact that I'm giving a positive contribution to society. It doesn't matter whether it's 19 or 26 cents. And the last thing is, I find I arrive on time where I used to often be late or very stressed out from traffic. Trips are a lot more predictable on the bicycle, and that's not only my personal impression, it also matches the results from our work at Digital Hub Mobility. At Digital Hub Mobility, we design and implement cutting-edge urban experiments to find out what needs to be done and can be done fairly simply and quickly to speed up sustainable mobility solutions. And these experiments 
they give an impulse for change. I'll tell you one example. We did an experiment, we called it unparking, where we freed up urban space by taking out cars. We freed up the space to redesign it, because our cities need redesign. They need, we need to grow more trees in our cities to keep them cooler in the summers and to make them more resilient against climate change. And to do that, we need space. So the households involved in the, in the experiment put away their cars for four weeks. They got a mobility budget from us for 300, of 300 euros, and they used everything that was available in their neighborhood, every mode of transport. So, of course, their own bike, public transport, bike sharing, car sharing, scooters, uh, mopeds, taxis, whatever there was. And we had three strong results. First, nobody used, fully used, the 300 euros we had given them, so it was cheap. Second, they didn't miss the car in their everyday routines, but they did miss them on the weekends when they wanted to take trips to the beautiful Bavarian lakes or the mountains. And these are very valuable results for companies and cities that want to come up with new mobility solutions. That's why I love the Munich mountain bus, which now takes bikers and hikers to coveted locations in the mountains that were previously only accessible by car. Now, every city has its different issues, so these experiments will render different results and different measures. So everyone who lives in our urban areas should simply consider their options, try out new things, it's hard to break long habits, but give it a try. Stick it out for a few weeks and find out what works for you. And on a society level, we must increase the research on the true costs and benefits of the different modes of transport, discuss them widely in our society, and put them to use, make them a basis for rational political decisions. If we do that, then our mobility system won't feel so alien anymore, and my friends from outer space won't have to shake their heads in disbelief. Thank you.